Good evening, everyone. Tonight, we'll fill you in on all of the latest local headlines and groundbreaking world news. In this week's headlines, Amherst College sexual assault case advances in federal court, students react to Blarney Weekend, and an exclusive interview with SGA Vice President up for re-election, Lily Wallace. I'm Leah Geddes. And I'm Maria Manning. You're watching UMass News Now. The Extravaganza Festival for the Legalization of Marijuana in Northampton has become so popular in recent years that student organizers are struggling to come up with a budget for the vendor fees. The cost of renting the vendor space has shot up from $250 in 2016 to now $1,000 with this being a free event for all. It has become difficult to come up with the money for the cost since the popularity has grown so much. The, the group's relation, public relation officer, UMass junior Morgan Phillips said they will be sending out new contracts and that the focus of the event will be the push for federal legalization. A sexual assault case against a former Amherst College male will advance to federal court after the student claimed the school unjustly expelled him for alleged sexual misconduct, according to the Daily Hampshire Gazette. In 2013, the male identifying as John Doe was expelled for raping a female student in 2012. Amherst College attempted to dismiss the case last Tuesday. However, U.S. District Judge Mark G. Mastroianni denied the request and moved the case forward on counts of Title IX violations, breach of contract, and breach of covenant of good faith and fair dealing. Mastroianni did dismiss claims that stated the college discriminated against Doe based on race. Both Doe and the woman he is accused of assaulting agree that she performed oral sex. However, the woman told the college's attorney that while she consented initially, she revoked consent during the act. Doe stated that the college failed to properly consider and document text messages the woman sent later the same night, resulting in what he believes is unfair discipline. If Doe's claims are proven true, a note about his expulsion could be removed from his transcript, and he could be entitled to damages, as well as a chance to finish his degree at Amherst College. On Sunday evening, white nationalist flyers were found stuck in windshield wipers throughout Lot 44 on the UMass Amherst campus, reports The Wire. The flyers were promoting the group titled Identity Europa, white nationalist group named a hate group by the Southern Poverty Law Center. UMass student Zach Peterson told Amherst Wire he found one of the flyers on his car, and after reading what they were promoting, he made a point to not only remove the one on his car, but on also other cars in Lot 44. The UMass Police Department has been making efforts to investigate who is putting out these flyers and will take action once they are found. These flyers have also been found at Indiana University and other college campuses nationwide. While students settled into their second semester this year, Rune Percy, a mechanical engineering senior at UMass, attended the 16th World Summit of Nobel Peace Laureates in Bogota, Colombia. Nicole DeFutis of the Amherst Wire reports that Percy attended the summit as a youth delegate and spent his afternoons in workshops and discussions with public officials who spoke about peace, democracy, and sustainable development. Percy stated that one of his main takeaways from the event was a sense of empowerment and realization that change happens when people stand up and voice their ideas. He also noticed that education can be a catalyst for change and told Defutis that there exists a, quote, misconception that peace is just the absence of war, when in reality, peace is just a culture of education. Springfield narcotics detective Stephen Vignall is facing his third domestic abuse charge in the Palmer District Court. Vignall had two warrants for violating a restraining order against his ex-girlfriend and was arrested Wednesday, March 1st. He was released the following morning on a bail of $250 and was ordered to wear a GPS monitoring bracelet. He will be moving to Texas until June when he will have to go to court for assaulting one of his family members. This past weekend was the infamous Blarney blowout. And while students continued the tradition of layering themselves in green, festivities were much quieter than they have been in the past. According to Y. Kai of the Amherst Wire, only one alcohol-related arrest occurred at the Mullins Center during the Mullins Live concert, in addition to two alcohol-related medical transports. This starkly contrasts conceptions created in 2014, when 55 people were arrested, that the weekend is swamped with underage drinking and disorderly conduct. 
This year, the residence hall security heightened its guest restrictions. Parking vans were placed in off-campus housing areas, and non-UMass guests were not allowed in the dining halls. Some students believe that the free concert sponsored by the SGA, which hosted artists Mike Posner, Jeremiah, and Flo Rida, helped to dispel some of the Irish rowdiness. Juhi Dazrath and John Decker asked students what they thought of the weekend. Here's what they found. This is Juhi Dasrath with UMass News Now on the Monday after Blarney weekend. After 2014's outstanding display here at UMass, police presence has stepped up, leaving students to find a creative way to celebrate on campus. 2014's Blarney blowout caused police to intervene after someone in the crowd started to set off fireworks. While some students complied with officers, others fought back, causing police to respond. Since then, UMass has heightened security measures to prevent this kind of violence again. While some were deterred by the extensive police presence, others were discouraged by the cold. Like, I just didn't want to because, like, yeah, the cops and it was, like, 30 degrees out. The weather was, like, really cold and people were going out with, like, shorts and skirts and I was like, I'm not about that. So, if, to me, it wasn't worth it because it's too cold out. I mean, the summer is right around the corner and Blarney's pretty much just going to be any other summer day, so... None of my friends really went either. We all just kind of had a, a, a casual, normal day. It wasn't a big event for us. This is Juhi Dasrath with UMass News Now. Thanks, John and Juhi. In other five college news, Smith College student climate activists protested the campus using fossil fuels on Thursday evening. Organizers with Divest Smith College met with Smith's Board of Trustees. Since 2012, students have been protesting for the college to cut off the $100 million that has been invested in fossil fuel companies like ExxonMobil and Luke Oil. The Advisory Committee on Investor Responsibility is collaborating with students, trustees, faculty, and staff to work on this issue. Smith is also working with the study group on climate change to come up with suggestions to improve sustainability on campus. Last Thursday, Congressman Richard Neal of Springfield condemned reports that House GOP leaders are concealing a bill to replace Obamacare and dismantle the Affordable Care Act. Democrats called House Republicans to share their legislation, according to a Mass Live report by Shannon Young, and signaled to Republicans that there is, quote, no place to hide. U.S. Representative Mike Thompson also argued that the lawmakers' secrecy keeps Democrats from properly assessing health care legislations and is a, quote, affront to the American people, who both the Democrats and Republicans represent. Neal stated that with tensions rising between the parties, the GOP legislation might surface this week in the Ways and Means Committee. Since Massachusetts opioid abuse law has been released, which only allows the first prescription to be for up to seven days and to people over the age of 18, over 8,000 do doctors have been required to take over 20,000 courses related to prescribing pain medications. Doctors are taught other ways to treat pain before having to turn to opioids. Patients are also required to have a checkup before receiving more pills. This is aimed to reduce the opioid abuse in Massachusetts, and this law also includes codeine, which is often in cough medicines. While on the topic of opioid addiction, Boston Medical Center has just received $25 million gift, which they plan to use to fight the opioid addiction in Massachusetts. Boston Medical Center's newest addition will be the Graken Center for Addiction Medicine, named after investor John Graken and his wife Eileen. According to the Massachusetts Energy and Environmental Affairs website, Governor Charlie Baker has recently declared March the Massachusetts Maple Month. Baker's declaration arrived in an effort to support the Commonwealth's maple producers and encourage residents to focus their maple purchases locally. A ceremonial sugar tree tapping by the Department of Agricultural Resources at Steve's Sugar Shack in West Hampton kicked off the month pancake enthusiasts are sure to love. Last year, more than 77,000 gallons of maple syrup were produced by Massachusetts locals, bringing in more than $6 million to the Commonwealth community. The industry employs over 1,000 workers, and EEA Secretary Matthew Beaton called the production, quote, a sustainable Massachusetts tradition. As SGA elections wrap up this week, Tyler Maxwell and Devin Toll speak one-on-one -on -one with the recently hired Vice President Lily Wallace, who is running for re-election with President Anthony Vitale. Here's more. News Now sat down with Lily Wallace, Vice President of the SGA, to discuss important campus issues and updates during her busy campaign week. The one big thing that everyone keeps saying, this needs to be fixed, this needs to be fixed, is the area government system. Coming from being involved in res life in 
something that I, in, as in my role as a house council president and having to work with area governors, I saw that the program really needed a lot of help um, and it wasn't being properly supported because depending on who the vice president was, it was either completely ignored or like someone was paying attention to it. I actually just finished a 30 page motion to go before the Senate, which will be going before our next Senate meeting to propose the dissolution of area governments under the SGA um, and moving the award to res life so they can really achieve their mission of creating area unity. Lily also informed News Now on some exciting details about renovations to the hatch. The hatch got closed down because of a couple different like things happening with Blue Wall getting renovated and reopened and also with just like some building code violations. So after my first year it was shut down and it's been closed for two years. But the issue is that we have a huge problem with student space on campus. We're reopening the hatch as a place for students to really um, have autonomy to do what they what they need in there because we need places for people to be like just doing their homework, to be having like informal club meetings. Um, there's going to be tables, there's couches, uh, there's a small uh, little Pete's Coffee-esque kind of a place that's being opened up. Everyone thought that the SGA was going to have to pay for it, but he got dining to pay $100,000 to renovate that space um, and get it like opened up. It'll be opening right after spring break, which I think is going to be huge. And the other thing which is the longer term goal for it is that as soon as a student business is ready, um, the Pete's will be taken out and we'll be putting a student business in there. Reporting for UVC TV's News Now, this is Tyler Maxwell and Devin Toll. Thanks, Tyler and Devin. In national news, Attorney General Jeff Sessions recused himself last Thursday from an investigation pertaining to charges which suggested Russia interfered in the 2016 presidential election, reports the New York Times. This means that Jeff Sessions recognized he may have a conflict of interest with the affair and will not act as a judge in a case. The recusement was one of the first public acts as Attorney General and comes after information surfaced about two meeting sessions had with the Russian Ambassador Sergei I. Kishyak during the presidential race. While several Republicans declared Sessions should not be included in the meddling investigation because his role is still unclear, Democrats demanded the Attorney General resign. President Trump backed Sessions' decision, saying Democrats were engaging in a quote, witch hunt, end quote. The idea of Russian interference has become a major ethical controversy surrounding the Trump administration. And on Thursday, the White House also confirmed that Trump's aide, Michael Flynn, had his own undisclosed meeting with the same Russian ambassador in December to, quote, establish a line of communication, end quote. Yet the New York Times points out that the extent and frequency of the relations are still unclear. Parallel to the number of protests held at UMass Amherst and in the Pioneer Valley, Republicans in Massachusetts have said they plan to file a similar protest-related bill. Recent protests in North Dakota regarding the Dakota Access Pipeline have been regulated in a new bill by Governor Doug Burgum, making it easier to control these protests. Over 200 police officers were on site to clear the protesters in North Dakota. These bills are aiming to make protests more safe and for protesters to be in communication with the police about plans. UMass has been seeing a huge move towards complete sustainability over the past few years, from taking away the straws at Blue Wall, to adding solar panels to parking lots, to new compost programs. Juhi Dastrath takes us inside the world of on-campus composting. This is Juhi Dastrath with UMass News Now at the Hampshire Dining Common in Southwest Residential Area. After recent research has shown UMass ranking among the top 50 greenest colleges in the United States, we are here to explore how much food actually gets composted. The goal at UMass is to reduce our carbon footprint. Composting programs have been implemented across campus to aid in this process. Hampshire Dining Commons Supervisor Denise Ritzel explained that the goal is to be smart when distributing and making food. Items that cannot be used get thrown into composting bins where they are kept until pickup the next day. She explained that most of the composting comes from the dish room, which produces about 13 to 16 full toters a day, much more than the prep kitchen, which produces about four to five. And I do think that it's great that um, UMass is one of those schools who have taken charge in terms of um, being green, being more proactive in the green community. Um, the fact that um, they're using things that are biodegradable, that can be marketed, um, that um, is good for the earth is amazing, honestly, and completely commendable. Dining common workers are advised to use portion control when serving students as they try to prevent the amount of food that gets thrown away every day. 
When I'm on campus, I don't typically waste because that's just not who I am. But if I do t feel like, okay, I got a little too much or um, I can't really finish this and I am not in a situation where I could just take it to my room and put it in my refrigerator, I do feel less guilty. According to UMass's website, the university collects over 1,500 tons of food waste a year, making this the largest recycling stream on campus. This is Juhi Dastrath with UMass News Now. Thanks, Juhi. In world news in recent weeks, the number of refugees freeing from Mosul has risen to 57,000 from 46,000 on February 19th since, they, since the fighting has started. They have been fleeing to an area about nine miles west of Mosul. Large numbers of Iraqis have been leaving since the start of the military operation to take back the western part of the city from ISIS. Twelve Mosul residents were treated as well last week for injuries that may have been caused from a terrorist attack. The Iraqi government is said to be able to handle another 100,000 displaced people from Mosul at refugee camps. Over the weekend, Twitter enthusiast President Donald Trump accused former President Barack Obama of wiretapping his phones during the 2016 campaign. CNN's Pamela Brown and Shimon Prakukpex reported Monday that FBI Director James Comey has incre was incredulous about the tweets and, in order to prevent the FBI from looking bad, asked his staff to contact the Justice Department and have them dismiss the allegation. His request allegedly went unanswered, and the FBI director continues to find a way for both his organizations and the Department of Justice to formally announce Trump's tweets as untrue. In his press conference Monday, Press Secretary Sean Spicer also stated that he is almost 100% certain that Trump and Comey have yet to speak about the issue, and added that he would let Comey speak for himself about his concerns for Trump's wiretapping accusations. And that concludes tonight's newscast. Be sure to tune in at the same time next week for all the latest local headlines. I'm Leah Geddes. And I'm Maria Manning. Thanks for watching UMass News Now and have a great night.